As she stepped out of the docking tunnel into the main hall, Grisha was a bit overwhelmed by the mass of people in the brightly shining spaceport. For an empathic species like she was, it took significant focus to filter out all the raw emotional energy in a room this large and full of people. Getting her mental barriers up, she took a moment to get a look at the place. This was, far and away, the nicest port she had seen since she left her homeworld. When the thought crossed her mind, she was hit with a sense of loss. The nuclear exchange of the previous century had destabilised the environment so badly, only thin bands of land around the poles were able to sustain agriculture. Things had gotten particularly bad since her youth, so she decided to take her daughter, Jinya, and find somewhere they could make a better life for themselves. Her journey had taken them over six months so far, and along with the whole gamut of negative reactions to her and her species, there was a danger unique to her people. She and Jinya were Deroli. Theirs were considered the most desirable slave species in the galaxy. Their innate ability to detect the emotions of others, combined with their physical attributes that almost all humanoids found highly desirable, meant they were prime targets for slavers of any stripe. They were not without their countermeasures, however. Most of them had learned to use their skills to manipulate others and get what they needed or wanted from them. Some even took it as a sign of superiority and manipulated others as they wished. The results for their victims were usually a minor loss of credit slips. Sometimes, however, their manipulations led the victims to complete financial or emotional ruin. The actions of those that acted, such ways, had cast a pall over her entire race. Everywhere she went, she was met with distrust, suspicion, and oftentimes anger and revulsion. At the same time, underneath those surface emotions, there was almost always a smouldering attraction present if the other party was intimately compatible. With so many of her people fleeing their planet, they quickly gained a reputation as homeless wanderers if the observers were being charitable, or thieves and con artists if they weren't. Generally, she and Jinya were viewed with suspicion and distrust. Even when people tried to be polite on the outside, she could still tell how they felt about her on the inside. That hurt the most. Over the past six months, she had been constantly mentally beaten down by the oppressive fact that everyone she had met disliked her and her kind, and she felt it every time. In other circumstances, she could just raise her mental barriers and weather the storm. With her current situation, that wasn't an option. For her and Junior's sake, she needed to always keep her defences down, when directly dealing with others, so she could detect any threats. She was mentally exhausted. Everyone she had met since she left her home planet had been just another wave in an unrelenting sea of disdain, distrust and lust. There was, however, one person that was different. He was a human military officer she had met about five months ago in one of the spaceports. She had quite literally run into him as her head was turned to keep track of her daughter. When she straightened, all she saw was a uniform. Her heart sank. Military ties made up the worst of her experiences since she left her homeworld. This was bad, because she saw he was one of a group of personnel from various spacious services. The situation got much worse when she looked up to see she was gazing into the face of a human. They were new to the galactic community and by all accounts terrifying in their capacity for violence. Quickly averting her eyes, she sputtered, Oh, oh no, I'm so so sorry. She expected the usual wave of displeasure, irritation, recognition and distrust to wash over her when such things happened. Squeezing her eyes tightly together, she prepared mentally for the impact. She was astonished when she felt none of those things. All she detected radiating from him was sincere concern. Nobody had reacted that way toward her since before she had left her home city. Even there it was a rare thing. It was like a warm blanket over her weary mind. She instinctively opened up to it and soaked it in. She heard a voice from a few paces away to the left. You had better check your pockets to make sure your credit slips are still there, human. This kind is known to be lies and thieves. Then she felt it all. Especially forceful was the distrust, revulsion and hot anger. She'd been lulled into letting what little defences she dared maintain to relax, and the force of it all hit her like a hammer. She had never felt such strong emotion without it leading to imminent physical violence. She instinctively stretched out an arm and grabbed Jinya. She curled herself around her daughter to keep her safe. The red-hot anger turned to incandescent rage, and the raw force of the human's feelings was enough to make her light-headed. She clenched her body for the blow that was sure to come. 
Then she realised it wasn't directed at her. You know what? You guys go on. I've lost my appetite, the human said. In a perfectly calm tone, diametrically opposed to the emotions pouring out from him. What? You said you were starving and could eat one of those large herd animals from your planet not five minutes ago, one of them retorted. The human's emotions flared up again at that, yet still he calmly spoke. Go on, we'll see about scheduling something for another day. As the group departed, the oppressive emotional weight radiating from the human lowered to a smouldering moat, but it didn't go out. Now she was again awash in feelings of concern and compassion. She relaxed and let go of her daughter. Junior took a step back and looked up at the human with her child's large eyes. You're a Diroli, aren't you? he asked. There was that comfortable blanket again. It felt warm and safe. The human was feeling protective over her and her daughter. She relaxed more than she had allowed herself to in months and said, Yes, I am. I heard about what is happening on your world. I'm so sorry for you. To say it was refreshing to hear someone say something sympathetic and charitable to her and her daughter would be fundamentally lacking. These, the first kind and genuine words she had received in months, were like rain on a parched desert soil. The emotions and words had an effect akin to slipping into a hot bath, and she actually felt her muscles relaxing. We are paying the price for our own foolishness, but I appreciate your words. You could not understand how much I feel. I am Lieutenant Fitzgibbons, but you can call me Gib. Hello, Gib. I'm Grisha. It's a pleasure to meet you. Are you hungry? Could I take you both somewhere to get a meal? His invitation was genuine in its intentions. There was no hint of subterfuge or manipulation behind anything this human offered. Yes, we would like that very much. Wouldn't we, Jinya? The child moved and hid herself behind her mother's leg, staring up at the human with one exposed eye. A tiny, mouse-quiet noise emerged from the little girl. Yes, please. He took them to a small eating establishment, and pulling up his sleeve, revealed a small electronic device strapped to his arm. He tapped it a few times and spoke to the food vendor, and soon they were sitting at a table eating. What is that device on the inside of your forearm? She asked, between bites of something he called... A rough approximation of a pizza. Oh, this. It is a personal data keeping and communication device. It allows me to network back to the ship or directly to my crewmates if need be. Pretty much all humans carry one. You can use this to purchase food from vendors with our currency slips? Well, yes and no. We do patrols by here every month or so, and I've got a line of credit for the station that I can reimburse later, when I get paid. She had never been treated this way by anyone of another species before. What made it so confusing was that he was radiating only concern and a desire to be helpful. He wanted nothing from her at all. She took a moment and focused on him, trying to sound deeper into his mind. While rare, it was possible for some species to mask their true intentions from her kind. If humans had that level of control, she needed to make sure Gib was not some kind of bad person hiding his motives. As she dealt, she felt something. There was a strong block of emotional control. Very strong. He was exerting significant mental effort to not feel... something. There were no species as adept as hers at finding ways around such barriers, and the stakes were so high she had to know. As she examined his mind in this way, she found something very odd. Gib was, through sheer force of will, actively compressing a powerful emotion into a tiny bright speck. He was unrelenting in his drive to suppress it, the mental and emotional energies, if you can call something so non-physical energies, were locked in battle in his mind. The tension between the two forces was almost too much to get close to. For her and her daughter's sake, however, she had to. She focused on the suppressed emotion and examined it. She pushed through the strong waves of compassion, protectiveness and sympathy. There, past the surging surface emotions, she found what he was refusing to let himself feel. What she discovered completely caught her off guard. He was desperately trying to not feel attracted to her. You know, she began, my species has the ability to feel the emotions and intentions of other species. Sometimes if they are strong enough, we can often feel their desires, especially if they desire us. As she spoke, she felt him shift through attention, to curiosity and interest, and then quick contemplation. When she mentioned their ability to sense the desires of others, he flashed with embarrassment and anxiety. Oh, well... 
I hope you haven't been getting that from me. I assure you I have no proper intentions for you um, like that, ma'am. She was genuinely amused at his response, and smiled as she reached across the table to touch his hand. No, no you don't. I can feel the struggle in you to contain those kind of feelings towards me. I am trying to say thank you. You are truly a noble example of your species. A twinkle of mirth went through her, as she saw his face redden as he felt a mixture of embarrassment and gratitude. There's nothing special about me. I'm just a guy trying to do a little good in the universe. If all your kind is like you, then I assure you that your species share something truly special. Gib changed the subject, and they chatted until long after the food was gone. Afterward, he took them on a small shopping trip in the station, after that, to make sure they had basic supplies he felt they were lacking. Jinya got two brand new sets of clothes and some durable and easy to roll luggage. Grisha got much the same, but he also provided her with a basic wrist data unit like he had. It wasn't a stocked item on the station, but after explaining her situation to the captain of their ship, the order was given to the quartermaster to provide whatever was necessary and helpful. He was on leave the following day as well, so they met up again and spent more time together. Junia started to open up to humans more, and Grisha had the opportunity to rest and even heal a little emotionally, under Gibbs unspoken care. Unfortunately, their time was limited due to the ship needing to continue its schedule. As they were saying their goodbyes, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small sleeve of credit slips. Here, take this, he said, extending them towards her. I talked to some of the crew and we put together a little collection for you. I know it's not much, but it's all we have until we get paid next week. She looked at the sleeve and saw a large amount of galactic currency credits. Her voice caught in her throat. I can't, she said after regaining herself. It's too much. What will you use to buy food and lodging? He waved a hand dismissively and said, Oh, don't worry about that. We can stay on the ship and eat in the mess hall. She felt a small hint of displeasure and disgust from him as he mentioned the mess hall, but his lack of concern for his own situation was genuine. I, we, insist, he said. She felt he was not going to allow her to refuse him, so she acquiesced. If you are certain, thank you for your kindness, we will never forget it. Before he left, Gib introduced him to the concept of a selfie. He got the three of them together and held her new datapad far out from them, pointing the device back at the group. He took a picture of them smiling and looking up at the camera. She saw that it captured the image well, and was glad to have a memento of their time together. That was when she decided to try and get to Earth. The reports were that it was a truly deadly world with oppressive gravity, dangerous fauna and hazardous environmental conditions. If humans were there, and if they were anything like Gib, she knew it would be worth it, however. So here she stood, five months later in the primary transit station above Earth. Their formerly new clothes were tattered and their money all but gone. The two of them had faced hard prejudice and demanding conditions to get here, but they had made it. Ordinarily, it would have been only a few weeks to make the trip, but they had been forced to travel far longer than usual through the fringes of the trade lanes. In interviewing various captains to take them to Earth, she found only one that was safe. He was an old male, well past his breeding years, so he was only interested in her money. Also, she sensed he had the honour to keep his contracts. They had not seen another human since they parted ways with Gib. On their journey, they found out all they could about humans and Earth. They passed many nights together, huddled together over the data device Gib had acquired for them. They watched videos and read countless articles and reports. Any time they found anything related to the human military, they especially took note. Gibb served on what they now knew was called an Orion-class battlecruiser. Every time they learned something new, excitement radiated off of Jinya at the thought of going to the human home planet. It had given them both much-needed hope. Now that they were here in orbit, the little one was hardly able to contain herself. For Grisha, it was also much to take in. The last three hubs she had gone through had been dark and filthy freight stations, with environments so choked with pollutants that they could only barely be classified as having life support. It hadn't been much better on the freighter they had put passage on to get here. When the doors of the docking clamp opened, the fresh, clean atmosphere of the station surrounded her. She inhaled deeply, and the pristine air revitalised her. As she stepped in, the grandeur and beauty struck her. For such a recent addition to the galactic community, humans had already made themselves an impressive trade hub, 
and it was in full operation. Thousands of beings from dozens of species flowed in rivers of life through expansive halls. As she watched, a group of Birkari merchants made their way past in the lavish finery of their caste. They were somewhat perturbed by a group of young Thorflian adolescents running through their procession, wearing shirts that said, Earth Adventure Tourism in glowing letters. A huge reader board near the centre of the station floated gracefully in the air and projected holographic arrival and departure times. In the sparsely populated freighters she had been on, her ability to block out emotional stimulus like this had gotten a bit rusty. She walked over to a column and leaned on it with her eyes closed. As she was focusing on filtering out everything, she was hit by a wave of the all too familiar emotions of the past few months. Disgust, irritation, suspicion, and of course lust. To one extent or another, most negative or licentious emotions that could possibly be levelled at her and Jinya were. She was light-headed, and only vaguely aware of her surroundings. The light coming through her eyelids dimmed and pulsed as she distantly felt a group of people brush past her. Within a minute or so, she had finally regained her mental defences enough to get moving again. She opened her eyes to see the sideways glances of over a dozen species in their sullen disapproval. She shook her head slightly and reached her hand up behind her. Come on, Jinya. We have to get to the Earth Government Representative's office. As she looked around, her head swiveled to take in the surroundings. She was looking for some signage telling her which way to go. Finally, she saw one and situated herself. Flexing her hand out with a bit of frustration, she said, Come on, Jinya, take my hand and... She looked down, and Jinya wasn't there. Annoyance fled in the face of panic, as she realised she couldn't feel her daughter's emotions anywhere. She looked around desperately to try and catch sight of her, but it was no use. While she had stopped outside the main flow of pedestrian traffic, the mass of people mere metres away was impenetrable to her frantic searching. She realised it was no use. She needed help. Nearly frenzied now, she looked and saw a terminal with a human female in some sort of uniform behind it. The uniform didn't look like any military or police clothing she had ever seen or read about, but it would have to do. Running over to her, she cried, Please, you must help me. My daughter Jinya is gone and I can't find her. Here is a picture of her. Please, help me. As Grisha was speaking, she held out her arm and tapped the device Gib had given her and found the picture of the selfie they took so many months ago. The human woman wasted no time. She took Grisha's arm and pressed the device's screens together. The picture copied over to the humans. She then drew a circle around Jinya and tapped through a series of what the desperate mother could only identify as its communication settings. There was far too much emotion in the station and in her own heart to detect anything of what was going through the human's mind, but her posture and body language seemed focused but calm. As she was noting these things, the human brought her forearm up to her mouth and said, Station Command, this is Star Cruise employee Lorena Vlasquez, ID 29673, Amber Alert. I repeat, Amber Alert. I am sending you a picture now. A voice came back over the communications device and said, Affirmative, picture received, issuing Amber Alert. Lorena Vasquez took Grisha by the upper arm firmly, and leading her forward, she said, Come with me. As they began moving, the station went through a transformation. The lights all turned from the clean blue-white to an orange-yellow colour. A wash of new information flowed over the huge floating reader board, indicating all departures had been delayed. On every monitor, the images were replaced with the picture Gibber taken, with a red circle drawn around Jinya. A yellowish bar across the top of the monitor screen said, Amber Alert, while text at the bottom instructed anyone who saw her to contact the nearest human immediately. What stung Grisha the most, however, was that every human had stopped what they were doing and were looking at their communication devices. When the image had been received, a brief moment of study was taken, and then all of them immediately began looking around their local areas for her daughter. The hall in front of the two women was congested with aliens mulling around in confusion, and humans searching for the missing child. As seeing their way blocked, the relatively small human female of 5 foot 2, 157 centimetres bellowed, STAND ASIDE! The sheer volume that came from her stunned the aliens into obedience. The humans likewise moved out of their way, but didn't stop searching. Lorena Vasquez guided Grisha to an elevator, and they entered it. When it arrived at its destination, she found herself on the command deck of the station. From here, she saw that she had been taken to a tower far above the vast, 
saw the light station below. As they stepped out of the conveyance, they were greeted by two humans, one female who was wearing some sort of military uniform, and a male that was wearing fine looking but mostly probably civilian clothing. The female spoke first. Ma'am, I am Admiral Freeman of the United Earth Navy. I am in charge of the military assets of this station. Gesturing to the man standing next to her, she continued, And this is Magistrate Marcus Collins, the civilian leader of this starbase. Grisha was beginning to rein in her emotions now, and the press of the crowd was no longer a fantastic weight on her mind. She began letting the walls down to get a read on these people around her. She felt something she hadn't experienced since she visited the hive world of Jitix 7 in her youth. Unity of purpose. These humans were all singly focused on only one thing. They were driven to find Jinya. Sir, ma'am, I think I have something. One of the humans sitting at a station off to the side called out. Commander Freeman and Magistrate Collins moved over to hear the report, and Grisha followed them closely. I have the record of their arrival. The Magistrate gestured to one of the large, central screens. Put it up. The recording blinked to life on the screen, and there Grisha saw the moment she and Jinya arrived. They walked out of the airlock into the large hallway. She saw herself waver a moment, then lean up against a column for support. The crowd turned heads towards her, as she raised her hands to her temples in an attempt to focus. As she was doing so, a group of beings slightly bigger than an average human went by in a large group. They were all dressed in baggy brown robes and their faces were obscured by hoods. When the group had passed, Jinya was gone. Find that group immediately and update the alert to include them, Collins said. Yes sir, one of the technicians replied, and soon the image of the group of brown robed creatures was sent out. They all stood in tense silence for a moment before, off to the left, a woman's voice called out, I have reports from Quadrant 4, Level 16, that civilians in that area recently saw the group entering a docking tunnel. They said they heard what they thought may have been muffled screams. A brief moment later, the man who first found the arrival footage said, I have the record, two minutes ago, on screen now. Up on the monitor, the image resolved to show the group of brown clad creatures filing through a docking tunnel door. For the briefest moment, there was a flash of colour among the pool of brown. The screen froze and reversed. It stopped where the flash of colour had been. The skilled technician then zoomed in and enhanced the image. There, clearly, was Junya struggling to break free before being tucked back into the brown sea of robes. The ship just undocked, sir. We're joining to... Magistrate Collins cut him off, shouting so everyone could hear. FTR suppression, now! I don't want that ship to leave the system! Grisha ran to the edge and looked down at the massive bubble window of the command tower. There, far below her, she saw the ship ignite its thrusters and the telltale energy glow around it indicating it was about to make a hyperjump. As they did so, she watched the station below them extend huge, towering antennae. She knew by the glow that the fleeing ship was just about to jump away with her baby. Suddenly, a massive bolt of jagged, brilliantly white energy exploded out of the nearest antenna and struck the ship. The radiance of the FTL charge quickly dissipated. The magistrate pressed a button on the console and said, Departing transport, you are ordered to return immediately to the station and return the Diroli child. In response, the yellow-red light of the ship's main engines fled to life and it began moving out and away from the station. The magistrate turned to Freeman and said, Admiral, I officially request military assistance in the apprehension of these slavers and the retrieval of the kidnapped child. Grisha turned and focused on the woman. The emotions the officer was now radiating were deeply unsettling. It was more like feeling the thoughts and emotions of a feral predator than a sentient being. The human was seething with ferocity. Even in this, however, was the strict discipline and control she recognised months ago in Gib. The officer stepped over to a panel and, pressing a button, said, This is Admiral Freeman calling the Farragut. A strong voice responded out from the speaker. Admiral, this is Farragut, actual. Go ahead. She tapped some of the controls on the console as she said, Captain Roberts, we have a kidnapped a Ronnie child. The perpetrators are suspected slavers. I am sending you the information now. Your orders are to stop that ship and return the child by any means necessary. Affirmative, Admiral. Farragut, actual, out. Grisha turned her head to look out the window again. The little transport ship was gaining speed now, and was starting to get out and away from the station. The ship looked fast, and she began to despair at ever seeing her little girl again. As she watched, 
From behind the disc of the orbital base, two blue forms resembling comets came into view. They were plasma discharges. She watched as they careened through space and impacted with the aft section of the fleet transport. A soundless explosion bloomed out into the vacuum in vibrant yellows and blues. When the colour dissipated, the entire engine section of the ship was in ruins. She gasped, and following the faint and dissipating trail of energised gases, looked down to the edge of the station. There, emerging from underneath the massive trade hub, was a large military ship. She recognised it from a video she saw as an Ajax-class frigate. It pierced through the void towards its prey, and she saw smaller craft being launched. The little ships darted ahead, riding plumes of flame. The capital ship slowed as the smaller craft came into contact with the crippled transport. Moments passed by like days, as Grisha fretted for the safety of her child. What was happening on the ship? Had Jinya been hurt? What was going on? She was so deep in her own thoughts that she hadn't sensed the approach of the Admiral, and jumped when the other woman put her hand on her shoulder. She turned as the officer said, It's over. The Sabres have resisted have been killed, and the Marines are returning with your daughter now. Come with me and we will meet them at the gate. Is she hurt? Did those monsters do anything to her? Freeman's emotion showed she was unsure, she said. I haven't been told. We have a medical team heading to the gate just in case. Grisha, Valesquez, Freeman and Collins all got in the elevator and headed down to the station proper. As they descended, a view screen showing the current status of the rescue was mirroring thousands of similar monitors all across the station. The doors opened, and security personnel escorted them to the gate. They could only wait, and watch through the viewport windows as one of the marine boarding craft made its way carefully to the terminal. A crowd started gathering before they arrived, and now formed a press of people. There was a respectful space given to Grisha and her escort, and everywhere were feelings of concern. They were mostly humans, and Grisha felt a nearly overwhelming sense of gratitude towards them. They were radiating protective emotions that seemed to permeate the huge space. What she had known in Give those months ago, she now felt in a tidal wave surging over her. Unlike when she first arrived, the station in this area had gone silent. The bang and clang of the securing clamp whispered through the walls. Soon after, she heard from behind the closed docking causeway door the heavy rhythmic thundering of boots. They opened, and two marines in heavy zero-gravity assault armor stepped through. Black score marks dotted their armor, and they were splattered with what Grisha could only guess was blood. Then she saw a baby girl. Jinya was sitting astride the shoulders of a third marine as he emerged from the hallway. She rode atop the hulking human warrior like a royal princess of a past age. When she saw her mother, she beamed a smile at her. Mummy! she shouted. The marine dropped to a knee, then bowed low to allow Jinya easy access to the ground. There was a rising swell of emotions from the crowd that matched Grisha's own. The room was practically vibrating with relief, satisfaction and overwhelmingly joy. As the two of them were reunited, the gathered press of humanity could no longer contain itself, and a great cheer erupted as they embraced. Grisha wept, cleansing tears, and held her daughter close. When she finally blinked the water from her eyes, she looked up to see the Magistrate, Commander, Marines, and Mrs. Vasquez standing there with her. They radiated satisfaction and gratification. Her voice choked somewhat in her throat as she asked, Why? Why would you do this for us? We are the nobodies, the lowest of the low. Jinya and I are homeless refugees worth nothing to anyone as anything but slaves. Your actions must have cost you millions of credits and you put your lives at risk. Magistrate Collins smiled at her, and the warmth of his feelings matched the expression. You can sense her emotions, can you not? Yes, I can. Widening his smile, he explained, then you know how it makes us feel to help those in need. We ask no more payment than that. But, she pressed, I have seen the intentions of others that offer help. Always present is the desire for compensation. How can you be so different? When she had finished speaking, one of the marines reached up and took off his helmet. She felt in him a deep pride in his actions. He put a hand gently on her shoulder. It was a strangely light touch for a being in heavy powered armour. He looked into her eyes. She stared into his, and the human soul was laid bare before her. In that moment, she knew in the deepest part of her being that they would do it all again, a hundred times or more, to protect her and Jinya.
We'll all take care of you. Don't worry, you two are safe now. You really mean it? She said vacantly, still lost in his mind for a moment. Collecting herself and looking around at the crowd of humans, she exclaimed, No peoples behave this way for one not of their own. The Admiral smiled with warmth, that belied the primal intensity she was feeling as she said, We do.